Hello everyone, welcome to the open mic night. I hope you all can hear me just fine. I hope everything's coming through just a oh fucking k. Yes, today we're gonna be uh today's either gonna be a really fun casual open mic night where everybody just comes in, we're all pretty cordial, and we bring up alternative hobbies that we all like. Or this is going to turn into an absolute ni nightmare of a slugfest about which hobby is best. Either way, I'm all for it. So, <laughs> whatever energy you want to bring, bring it on. I'll be happy to bring it. Um, yes, so today's topic is the best 40k alternative hobbies. Now, the focus of the open mic night is actually discussing the alternative hobbies. Now... Of course, if you want to discuss them in the vein of how they are better or worse or what have you compared to 40k, I'm not going to restrict that by all means. But I highly encourage you guys to also come in with the approach of this is another hobby I like and here's what I like about it. As opposed to it like comparing contrast with 40k. Now, of course, I'm inviting that by having that in the title, best 40k alternative, but again... I, I encourage either, but I certainly have a preference for one. Um, I already have a list of them that I, I know of, and I'm actually super uh, interested for people to bring to my attention a given hobby here or there that I'm not aware of. So real quick to welcome some folks to the chat. Tiki the Hut, welcome. First in earlier. Nice and sounds like it's going to be a fun open mic night. Yes, I agree, and I'm glad you think so as well. Uh, five by five, yeah. Kill Team Hungry. Hi, Asmo. Good... Uh, good to see you, man. Good to see you, too. How you doing, man? Long time new see or chat. Actually, I saw you post in a Discord. I just got home from work for context, but uh, I, haven't had a, I haven't had much of a chance to, uh, you know, check in on things. I wanted to do this uh, open mic, though, from, from the get-go this morning, but I didn't have time because, you know, I had to go to work, and I doubt, doubted anybody would be awake at the time I woke up to go to work. But now that I'm home, I had it set up, ready to go, and I'm excited. So, of course, as always with the call line Discord, there is a link in the description of this stream, which I will copy and paste in the chat right now. This leads you guys straight to the call line Discord, where I encourage you guys to wait in one of the call rooms. Uh, they are numbered by priority who, like, the next caller is. Please sort yourselves. Um, I do keep my eye on it, so I can try my best to keep order, but... Just so you know, it, it's easier on me if you guys just treat it like a line, right? So, first call is going to be one, next call is going to be two, next three, and then when I pull in the next person, you then move up to one. So, I always pull from one. That's the best way I can explain it. So, yeah. Also, make sure to leave a like on the stream. Always, It always helps to get that level of support. And, uh, of course, I always like to see, uh, I, I like to see people who are enjoying the open mics. Nice, I played a nice alternative hobby for a while, and I will introduce it to my son when he is old enough. Nice, nice. I'm actually interested to hear it if you can come on the open mic. If you can't, that's fine. You can just throw it out in chat if you'd like. But uh, I'm going to prioritize callers, of course. So before I bring in Tiki, who's already waiting in call room run, I do want to list off the hobbies I'm aware of. That way you guys, if, if you are here to kind of introduce one that I may not know of, you'll know what I already know of and you know, can go from there. So the alternative hobbies to 40k that I'm aware of, uh, and I'm going to leave it to you guys to bring them up and discuss them, but the, this is just some, listing some off, some off for you guys. Our Bolt Action, War Machine, and I think there's a, a, a kind of twin uh, thing alongside War Machine. I'm not quite sure what the name is, though, but I know War Machine. Conflict 47 and Gunpla. Now, Gunpla is... Uh, whereas Bolt Action, War Machine, and Conflict 47 I'd consider sister or brother hobbies to our own, I'd consider Gumpla a cousin hobby. Because though there are, is some direct, you know, through line between the two hobbies, mainly from the miniature painting side of things, and even then it's kind of loose to a degree, Gumpla is extremely different from 40k in every other category. So, yeah, there's that. So, those are the ones I'm aware of. I... Don't know any other ones, so I'm going to be super interested to see what you guys uh, bring to the table. Welcome, Curtis Thompson, to the stream. Greetings, I am at work, or else I would join call in. Ah, that's fine, man. Alternative games I can recommend. One page rules. Yes, actually, actually, no, I am. I should have remembered that. Yes, one page rules. I forgot to include them, but I am aware of one page rules. 
I will add them in now, just so I <laughs> remind myself. Uh, one page rules, five parsecs from home. That sounds interesting, clearly a Star Wars one. Uh, five leagues from Borderlands, Space Station Zero, Frostgrave, Stargrave, and Bolt Action. All right, the only ones that I knew out of that list were one page rules and Bolt Action, so... <laughs> Dang, that's a lot of ones I didn't know. Uh, Tiki Dot says Gaslands and Carnival. Didn't know about those either. Zona Alpha. Don't know about that either. Man, we're, we just started and there's like 15 I don't know. <laughs> Holy crap. Uh, yeah, I, I'm going to pull in Tiki, our first caller. And of course, again, link in the description if you guys want to uh, hop in and discuss an alternative hobby you have to bring to the table. Uh, I'd love to hear it. So let me bring in my first caller. Tiki, my man, how you doing? Howdy, howdy, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I'll turn you up a little right. bit, though. There we go. Let me on the show, I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. I mean, it's open mic. No restrictions. So, what uh, alternative hobbies would you like to discuss and bring up? Well, I know you know I'm, I'm a big Conflict 47 guy, and I put out a couple of those videos, and I just recently started covering Carnivale, so... I'll talk about Gasland to Carnivale, and I'll leave everything else kind of for everybody else so we don't take up too much of the uh, mic time. No, that's fine. Go right ahead, man. I'm right, very so, curious. So did you ever play Assassin's Creed, especially like the Ezio series, like Assassin's Creed 2? Yes. All the, ones that um, the Ezio trilogy is my favorite of the Assassin's Creed, and I have played Valhalla, but everything in between uh, Black Flag and Valhalla I have not played. All right, so what Carnivale is, I'll roughly go over to the lore. I think I have, like, two, two shorts out for it. So there's this big, huge rent that happens across the sky, like this huge tear. It's very gothic horror style. And there's been this messenger who kind of went around Europe and tried to warn people, but no one listened to him. So this tear basically just burned Europe to the ground and gave certain people magical powers. One of the few cities that was spared was Venice, and nobody knows why. So right now in Venice, you know, in the canals and the towers and all that other kind of stuff, different factions fight for control of basically the last human city there is so you have the vatican who has a whole bunch of artifacts that they've been hiding for years this one faction you have like the assassin's creed which is kind of like the thieves guild they're a faction and that's of all the normal people in the town the nobles have kind of gone crazy and they kind of go out on murdering sprees and they're a faction um you have kind of cthulhu based horror that comes up from the water you know they're they're monsters you really fight in the water and they'll pull you down the canals and drown you they're a faction. One of the cooler ones are the Plague Doctors. So with the mental institutions in Venice, uh, they figured out how to turn people's mental craziness into actual harnessable magic. And they use that to like kind of recreate Frankensteins and other animals. And then with the other factions is all the people who have magical abilities. They've kind of formed their own faction. So it basically just turns into a 28 millimeter, very small team skirmish, kind of um, uh, kind of like Kill Team but very terrain heavy, almost like Necromunda, very three dimensional terrain heavy. You have canals, buildings, jumping around, you know, gun swords, boats. It's an absolute urban conflict around like the 1700s. Uh, that sounds actually fascinating. It's called Carnivale? Yeah, it's made by TT Combat. Carnivale, C-A-R-N-E-V-A-L-E. -E. Uh, Carnivale is a festival that happens. I was stationed in Italy, so I went to it a couple times. I loved it. I've actually been to Venice quite often, um, so kind of why I'm partial to it. But uh, it's like a big masquerade event that kind of happens just before uh, just before Lent, and it's just a massive party throughout the whole city. And so that's why it's that's why it's kind of called Carnival. It looks it looks cool. Just, uh, I just looked up some Google Images stuff. Um, Carnival, yeah. Even just the models, like I said, if you're looking for alternate. Um, Templar models, you know, check out some of the Vatican models. Uh, I use a lot of their models for like some of my D&D stuff. Like they just have some really cool models. I, I never hear TT Combat mentioned very often, but what sold me was the terrain. Cause you just build these huge sections of, of, of Venice and you have to fight, like I said, in the water, on the boats, you know, jumping from towers. It's very, very fast paced three dimensional combat. I mean, that sounds awesome, man. And geez, I actually want to check it out now. I just realized this stream is going to be terrible for my pocket. Yeah, so with that being said, yeah, that is the downside. For me being a Yank and on this side of the pond, man, I have to choose very carefully when I do get models. Like, I have a, the starter sets are pretty good. Uh, but luckily, uh, I like kind of 
crossing my hobbies, I think it'll be a big thing that comes up in this in this chat, hopefully, is there's some terrain for it that are basically just flat buildings that you kind of just assemble out of cards, and then you can disassemble and they lay flat. Those are still 28 millimeters, so they work perfect for bolt action or conflict 47 as well, because they're very European based. So when you get those flat types of uh, buildings in their terrain section, it works great for any other 28 millimeter European based game. And true, that is that is something that um, is a is a valid thing to bring up. By the way, during the course of this open mic, if any of y'all also want to bring up the merits of cross pollination between these hobbies, just more than outside just the communities, but actually what in the hobbies can be transferred uh, and intermingled, I, I think that's also something really cool to bring up. And thank you for bringing uh, that up with Carnival and Tiki. No problem. Like I said, I, I have a lot of hobbies. I've had to like kind of put some by the wayside, including 40K. I know I left in 8th edition. I got rid of all my stuff to make room for some other ones. But I, I try and keep what I can to keep stuff going. And speaking of that, I'll kind of segue into Gaslands if you're ready for that. Gaslands is what I always recommend to everybody. It is has to be probably the easiest um, game to really get into. If you're an orc player and you like kit bashing, that's the way to go. All you need is the rule book. And in the rule book, it'll give you uh, tables and templates to print out. Or you can buy the templates. They'll be the templates you used to use back in 7th edition, like the Flamer templates and the Blast templates, very similar. Um, and there's movement templates for the cars. And you can get the um, the shifting dice if you need them, the gear dice, or you can just roll on the table. That works too. So what it is, is it basically combines all of your car combat stuff you've ever liked. Twisted Metal, Mad Max, Death Race, Vigilante 8, anything you can think of. It was, it's pretty cool. So it basically combines all of those yeah. and you have different sponsors and teams and the scale is for Hot Wheels cars. So what I have to do is go out and buy a couple Hot Wheels cars from like any kind of store and that's it. It's not WYSIWYG, you can just work with that. But what I like and the thing I want to, what I sell people on is if you play 40K, especially Orcs, or what I recommend is you can get the templates in 28 millimeter. So what that means is you can now basically do like a uh, Gorka Morka race kind of with your Oryx and basically do like a Mad Max style thing or with your Space Marine bikes or all these other types of vehicles you have in 40K, you can actually use those vehicles. I mean, I have my, my war template. bikers. I wonder if they could be transferable somehow. Yeah, because I think the bikers just took a hit, right? Uh, the, yeah. With the legacy hit? Yeah, they did. Unfortunately... Oh, did I lose you? Oh no, I'm, I'm still right here. Sorry, I use I use a uh, push to talk. Okay, I thought sorry. you were gonna go on. I thought you were gonna go on about the legacy. legacy hit. No, I'm I'm, I'm trying to keep things like focused on like the old hobbies and not go on a rant about. For, again, my goal is not. I to, got you. My bad. I my, told you, no salt. Yeah, I got yeah, you. Yeah, uh, it's I'm, I'm avoiding salt. I could. So gaslands, there are some yeah, things. Gaslands. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. But I'll say gaslands is beautiful. Like I said, I built a whole bunch of different teams. Um, you, I'm pretty sure you can use Battle Scribe if you still have that on your phone. So that's a good way to kind of build your teams. You get certain amount of cans. There's different race. So there's traditional death race, like you'd see, where you got to drive to the checkpoints after the first one. Your weapons activate, and you can shoot and kill each other and move. Um, it's all about the gear. The sh the gear that you're going is how fast you're going. And your templates, you can only use certain templates at certain speeds. Like you can't do a hairpin turn while like in fifth gear because you're gonna spit out and flip and probably die. So it's a very fast-paced game. I played with my wife. She's brutal, so it's easy to teach, and she's very, very mean. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but there's other modes, too. Like, say, if you like Twisted Metal, there's modes where you have to – everybody fights – everybody plays normal cars. One person plays a tank. There's one of my favorite ways to teach. It's called the zombie bash mode, where there's a whole bunch of zombies out on the field, and you're basically just driving around an arena whoever can kill the most zombies you know, in the set amount of turns. And you can also shoot each other, too. There's a whole lot of ways to play Gaslands, and all it is is just one rule book. And some Hot Wheels. Sounds very so Death, Wraith, you, Death Race two thousands. Yeah, if you're really trying to, if you're really trying to, like, uh, should I try another hobby? That's probably the cheapest one to try. And if you love kit bashing or trash bashing, it is an absolute just so much fun. You can. Uh, I like doing WYSIWYG. Just going. I'm a nerd like that, but you don't have to. But you come up with some pretty cool team ideas. It's actually a lot of fun. Hey, it definitely sounds it. I mean, yeah, I'd be curious to check that one out. I wonder if there's... I swear I've heard of Gaslands before, but, like, maybe... Not, like, in any detail. This is the first time I've heard anything in detail. I'm wondering if there might be a group in one of the hobby stores I, I regularly mingle in my area that might play it. I'll have to look into that. But, uh... 
Yeah, Gasland sounds fascinating. I mean, Carnivale sounded cool as well, and I, I might check that out on its own, but I, I'll admit, out of the two you've mentioned so far, Gaslands is more interesting to me. You know me, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a dirty shill for my Conflict 47, too. You know how much I love that. So I always think that's a great thing. And the the way I kind of sell people on it, especially the bolt-action guys, is most of the units are just standard vanilla bolt-action. So you can get into bolt-action, get a couple weird stuff, and boom, you got a Conflict 47 army. Or get a Conflict 47 army, take away your walkers and your Tesla guns, maybe buy a normal tank, and boom, you got a bolt action army. So you can, it's it's kind of like how, ooh, I should, I must say, it's kind of like how 30K and 40K used to be, but I don't want to go there, you know, no salt. So, <laughs> yeah. So, like I said, I always recommend that. And the last thing I always drop there is I would say D&D, only because Baldur's Gate 3 came out. So what that did, without going too much of a rant, a lot of the people who had main character syndrome now just play Baldur's Gate 3. So you can actually have some good, fun D and D games nowadays. I mean, that's fair. Uh, I will say with D and D, and I didn't even think to put that on as a uh, relative hobby, but I get you know D and D is yeah, it's got minis. It's similar enough on uh, the list. You can play it any way you want. Like some of us, if you come from the war game, I, what I can say, if you come from the war gaming background, like me, I cut my teeth in Battlefleet Gothic at 40k. So when I run my D&D sessions, it's tactical, crunchy combat. It's not just like role playing and, you know, slice of life and who are you going to date? No, it's very, very crunchy, tactical style combat. And it's all up to the DM that you find. You can really find the kind of D&D game that you want to play. You're really just using it as a system to kind of play however you'd like. Yeah, I'm a forever DM with most of my groups that I play with. I mean, I have a group that uh, up until recently we've been playing Cyberpunk. Uh, uh, I almost said 2077. Cyberpunk Red, which is the updated TTRPG. I for... love Red. Oh, that is brutal. Yeah, Red, I love it. Red is pretty good. My, I have one problem with it, and that is the skill checks. It's because there's so many micro checks, and there isn't like at least as far as roll twenty allows you to do. Maybe I haven't read the proper like tabletop rules, uh, but it doesn't seem like there's any generic checks like body check or uh, the generic checks don't seem to be there. Everything is more down to the more minute sub checks with all these like different trees of things. So my my problem is there's too much. Uh, specific checks as opposed to generic ones, especially for situations where you would you would prefer to do one or the other. So that's my that's been my problem with it as as a DM. But otherwise, it has been a, it has been a very fun system. Yeah, speaking of generic, I didn't like the way they went the weapons where they just made everything kind of generic. I was like, eh. eh. But they did fix net running. I have to say, yes, that is the they, big they made improvement. Net running great in red. They made it. They basically made it a fun style magic system. They made it so much less complex, especially for whoever's running it. Oh yeah, I I absolutely love what they've done with the net running. That is that alone makes red worth playing. And though the again with frustration with the the check system. It, you get used to it eventually, and after a while, everybody in the group tends to understand what checks go where. There's very though there is more debate than you would have on your average D and D game, I would say, because again, D and D you can do generic checks uh, whenever there's uh, vagueness on whether this would be a more specific thing. But overall, red is pretty pretty damn good. Yeah, and like I said, with the uh, new Mad Max movie coming out and with the uh, Twisted Metal TV series that did just drop, I'm expecting a huge boost in the uh, gas lines. That's why I'll start releasing more gas lines. Or, I don't have any right now, but they're in the works. I'll start releasing gas line videos because right now I'm covering, you know, Conflict 47, Carnival, and gas lines. Those are the three I'm kind of focusing on. And I play D&D on my spare time, but I don't really cover that much on the channel. Yeah, I'm setting up a D&D campaign for my uh, Cyberpunk group. It's been a while since I ran a 5th uh, edition game, but... That's uh, in the works for me, but yeah, I mean, it's you both. Uh, you brought up several ones I didn't know before, though. Carnival and Gaslands didn't have a clue those existed. Yeah, before I take off, if you don't mind talking about where you think about, uh, I mean, I don't want to spoil it for your group, but do you have a do you have a setting you're thinking about running your D and D campaign? Uh, I always run custom ones. Uh, that's how I like to run my games. I don't usually use pre mades from like other people. I might like take inspirations from like other settings. And if I find a group that really want me to run, like, a specific setting or pre-made, I will. 
but my group are open to playing the custom one I'm working on. Yeah, I'm about to run one for a couple guys. So we're we're mostly using the Theros setting and just the setting. But a lot of the stuff I'll be writing myself. But it's gonna be kind of like a big classic Greek mythology, big like Odyssey style. Jason and the Argonauts. You know, they're on a ship going from island to island. The gods are feuding. I like the Theros setting. Not that I'm a big Magic the Gathering player. I haven't played that since like Tempest. But uh, I love the fact because the gods actually show up. You know, like you know, they get they get petty, they get jealous, and it's not just like they'll they'll bless you like they'll actually show up and start like wrecking towns so i've always found that kind of fun with the theros setting and yeah that sounds that sounds like it could be a lot of fun uh especially with the flexibility of each situ i is it like traveling location to location per session or does each session you uh, like you start a journey in a specific area and it can last multiple sessions it can last multiple sessions. I kind of have it blocked out uh, using the milestone leveling up feature. Uh, the way I generally run mine as a DM is I, is I kind of restrict a little bit of your character creation just so you have a common bond. Like in this one, uh, they're starting out level two, but their first level has to be a cleric. And they're all going to be clerics of the different gods. So they're kind of traveling together all as like representatives of the different gods. You know, and they're all going out there because there's basically what's going on is there's going to be a civil war between some of the gods. One god got together with another one, and they kind of like lied to another one. And they're kind of just trying to do a coup d'etat and overthrow the main god. So these guys are basically all on an adventure, and when all the stuff kind of goes down, so they're the only ones who can kind of help. But uh, it's it's as fast or as slow as they want to go. You know, I I do a lot of sandbox. They they have choice; they can do what they want, but the world's going to react to what they do. So as long as they're cool with that, it works. Yeah, I, I like it. I like to run my worlds like that as well. Uh... I don't like consequence-free settings. It makes it feel less engaging. But uh, thank you so much for coming on, man. I appreciate it. In time, man. Yeah, I'll definitely clear the net. Let someone else on here. But yeah, thanks for letting me talk about it. And like I said, you know me. I'm always, I'll always talking about Conflict 47 anytime. Take it easy, brother. You too. Alrighty, that was Tiki. Uh, let's see. Right now the waiting room uh, the waiting rooms are all empty. So again, if you guys would like to hop in and discuss your favorite alternative hobby, and as uh, Tiki just uh, showed off as a pretty dang good example, you can bring up hobbies that are very loosely related to 40k. Um, like we just brought up D and D and Cyberpunk Raid, which are TTRPGs. They're not war games. But as he also gave, uh, you know, his, his connection with 40K, though, is you can still run it very much like a war game to an extent. Very encounter-focused, very, you know, miniatures on the board and doing this, that, or the other. You, As long as you want to connect it back to 40K or connect, uh, connect it as loosely as you want, I want to hear it out. Although, of course, there's certain lines I'll draw. Like, if anyone tries to bring up video games... Like, like if you come in here and like, oh, you know, I, I like to play... Uh, pong it's like oh okay um that's not really what i'll consider an alt hobby but tabletop most tabletop stuff will i can see a connection so i'll pretty loosely you see that but obviously keep it within the genre all right nico is my next caller pulling him in now nico how you doing hey rocking the shades there buddy yeah i'm actually wearing these because <laughs> i have bags on my eyes that make me look half dead i don't know I see. Yeah, looking for 4K alternatives. Uh, I'm giving people the floor to talk about uh, other hobbies they play that, you know, are connected you know, to it. Similar, loosely. Right? Yeah, anything you want to. Yeah, yeah. basically, yeah. So, um, yeah, I think I already... Uh, I did mention it a long time ago, but this is... Um, this, one, this one is very, very niche, but it is, you know, getting on the rise. So, War Machine and Hordes, right? I think I already told you this before, and I've posted it in tabletop, um, you know, the chats and all that. Yeah. So this is a, um, like, as I said, uh, I actually did a mini, um, like, an introduction to this. But basically, you have a fantasy world that is uh, kind of in, in an industrial kind of setting, right? So you have, in this world, you have... Uh, Basically, magic and machinery, they work in complete harmony, right? There's no uh, conflict, uh, you know, like conflicting thing, 
right? And so with that, and also the fact that there are many monsters out there, you know, gigantic magic monsters that could destroy cities if just left uh, to their own devices, you have um, the very uh, industrial-themed, uh, the Iron Kingdoms, as they're called. The, uh, you know, they create golems. They're called warjacks. And hang on, I think... Um, well, I have already showed a few, but I think um, I'll just uh, send to the. What do you want? I'll just send to the. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? I'll just put it in tabletop. Uh, you know, to get a feel for the game, because this is also this is one of those worlds where, you know, you have mixed units. You have ginormous uh, robots. You have infantry. You have uh, mecha armor. You also have. Um, with some things uh, you have, uh, what's what's the word? Uh, yeah, you also have some uh, vehicles and also cavalry, all this kinds of stuff, right? Now, there's that, right? Giant monsters and of course steampunk robots. But there's also uh, mechanical, like undead things. There are, well, obviously you can't have a fantasy setting without racist elves, can you? <laughs> it is the trend. <laughs> It is the trend, okay? It's tradition. You don't you don't break the tradition. <laughs> yeah, uh, obviously there's that, and um, you know it's like, and obviously if you there's also the 40k equivalent of um, the orcs, but they're called the trollkin. Instead of being uh, you know uh, the Cockney British ones, they are the fucking Scottish. <laughs> fucking love that. I love it. Oh, mm -mm. and. Uh, yeah, it's just okay. Um, and this thing—that's the thing. Uh, I do think that would be um, a really good alternative. I don't—I haven't played it as much, but I do know that it kind of plays like a squad game. You know, like you have um, more comparable have, to kill team. Would you say? Yeah, yeah, kill team. Exactly. It's kind of comparable to kill team. And the thing is, uh, you like—you know—you. I think you said earlier that you like a setting that has consequences. This is one of those settings because the consequences all built up or, you know, they lead to the next thing. You know, there are nations that fall, ones who rise and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And um, do, if, if we're talking about like if we're talking about actual diversity, not just, the you know, the force kind. But I mean, like in terms of factions, in terms of like monsters, in terms of races. Oh, you are spoiled for choice. In fact, they keep they keep coming up with uh, brand new factions that uh, you know they don't break the setting in any way, and uh, that is absolutely commendable. I think uh, the latest ones is um, what was the latest one? It was the the very edgy sounding, uh, basically lizard. Um, what a lizard Saint Healy, you know, like similar to Halo and all that. Well. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just rambling on and on. Well, and on. That's kind of that's the whole point of this open mic is to let it give point. you guys a a platform to ramble mm. about other loves alongside 40k. Exactly. You know, like exactly. And yeah, go go ahead. I was I was just gonna say it's um, uh, you know, 40k is my bread and butter on the channel, and it's what I've covered. It's one of my favorite hobbies and favorite settings, mm -hmm. but. You know, I ramble all the time about how much I love it. And I think I think that's what shows something to be a good hobby and a good uh, experience for people is that you want to ramble about it. That shows you're passionate about it. If, you, if people came Athlete. on here and just told me the name of something and said, it's cool, you know, I, I'd yeah, be like, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't buy it. You don't sound enthused. But, you know, rambling tells it's, me you care. You want to talk about it. You know, you want to yeah, get out every little detail. Yeah, Exactly. And uh, not only, like, uh, before I get into a bit of a backstory, because I did forget to mention that. I just wanted to show you what some of the models look like. And they look just mwah, out of this world. Just all the little details and all that. And obviously, you can make uh, homebrews, which is very thankful. It's it's not every setting you can make a homebrew. but yeah, hold on, let me All right. So the, uh, hold on, let me share the look of the minis on stream here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there it is. All right. These are some examples of the minis he's showing. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'll, and... leave them, I'll leave them on screen. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so oh, wait, hold just on. a brief. Thank you, that. Thank you so much for the super chat. Sorry, man. <laughs> Thank you so much for the super chat. 
Uh, for yeah, us, no. the look on Azagoth's face screams, I wish I was playing Comic Force 7 right now, painting my awesome German Sh Shrek Wolfen. I'm actually still waiting for the kit I bought. But I hope I'm not having that look. I'm actually just paying attention. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry if I gave a glazed off look. I was just trying to pay oh. attention to what he was saying. <laughs> but thank you for the no. $5, Tiki. Uh. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh. No, no, it, uh, it's fine. I'm just sharing a couple of uh, uh, images while you're, uh, you know, talking all that. But uh, yeah, so uh, the basic, um, basically, uh, so this is a setting where, <clears throat> how to best put this? All right, so you know, the equivalent of the Vikings, right? But with like massive robots, they... Basically, they. This is a world. All right, I'll just uh, from the beginning. This is a world called Imorin, where war, political schemes, and invading hordes of monsters are a regular Tuesday. <laughs> I think I did already say that. And basically, I believe it was a thousand years ago or four hundred something. There was a um, invasion of another uh, of another. Uh, you know, like an otherworldly. You know. God, words. Uh, like a think of it like a Viking Rich. faction. Yeah, they're uh, you know they they came in and they took off an entire continent of Mormon because it's a continent, right? And uh, they took over and they essentially held like a dictatorship for thousands of years. Now, for a thousand years, and it took a long time for rebellion to come. And when it uh, when it did, there was an event called uh, the Corvus Agreement, what, or, uh, yeah, something like that. It was, no, the Corvus Treaties. The thing is, these treaties allowed the creations of different nations to exist, you know, because, you know, you know how cultures are, you, they all want to be their separate ways. But, if, but of course, as time goes by, uh, you know, <clears throat> old rivalries, old, uh, you know, it is... Uh, Peace can only last so long. All of them began to fight each other again. And, um, yeah, and then, right, so, I'll just, yeah, and again, uh, new factions coming. Uh, sorry, I, uh, uh, words. I'm just trying to really, uh, trying to. Are you nervous? Uh, no, 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 it's just, uh, it's like I didn't, I didn't exactly prep for this, you know? I didn't exactly prep for this. Well, would, it, would, it help to, was, oh. would it help to look? Excuse me. Would it help to look up the summary of the game? Uh, the wiki is kind of an ass. Like I said, this is oh, a okay. niche thing. Yeah, but that's ironic because uh, you know it's a niche within a niche. Yeah, it's a niche. Yeah, it's a niche within a niche. But you know, it is. Uh, you know, it is growing. But. Yeah, so basically there are a couple of I'll I'll just say a few factions that are um a couple of factions that are they're like the main ones. So you have let me just uh to give an example. So the quote unquote ultramarines ones, as in you know, the poster boys, is Signar. And Signar Oh hold on, just, hold on. Signar? Signar, yes. That's kind of as in. Um, has there been any uh, like honesty about their inspirations? Honestly, yeah, there is. Uh, Signar is rather um, similar, <laughs> shall to, I say? Uh, a, certain <laughs> a certain fantasy world, I believe. And, and by the way, no hate, like. No hate or any kind of like I'm not using that as like a like a minute like I'm not going at the creators of War Machine and Hordes. Mm -hmm. Well I'm just saying mm -hmm. Yeah like careful. It's GW you may or may not be building off of yeah. there. <laughs> if, yeah, they're known I mean, for trying to copyright banner. the word pauldron, okay? They're pretty petty when it comes to the shit. And I yeah, and I feel bad for the people who made war banner. It's like, hmm, we think that things. I think that sounds a little bit like Warhammer. Change that. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, gotta love that. But yeah, yeah. yeah uh, oh, you were, were you gonna say something or? No, no, no. Uh, I just wanted to throw in that little comment about the Signar thing. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I just did. Oh, God, I am. 
it is nighttime, so yeah. But um, well, yeah, they're basically their whole thing is like um, like electricity a lot. You know, it's very electric. They're actually the most advanced. They also have the most uh, history involved. But the good news is, right, is because unlike um, you know the ultramarines and stuff like that, they have they have their best rulers. They have their mid rulers, and then they have um, really like terrible leadership. Like they're not, you know, they're not um, a wholly good faction. It's just more so that they're the best option in this world for humanity. And on that note, stuff. would you say War Machine and Hordes are? Would you say the setting is a grimdark? Is it just more it's gray? Uh, like gray in... but there are some definitive heroes there's there are happy endings you know and i want to say the... yeah i want to i want to say like it is kind of like gray in a sense like uh you know there are definitely you know there are you know heroes within every faction or well not every faction is good you know there's definitely like the most evil is stuff like uh, cricks that are literally. Hang on. Oh, fuck me. My pizza. I'll be right back. Wait, did you say my pizza? Yeah. I was ordering pizza. <laughs> the pizza delivery man has arrived. If we all start hearing, I'll, I'll hang him up. <laughs> it's like it's a different kind of pizza. You know what I'm saying? It's like my pizza just arrived. <laughs> <laughs> it's my middle of explanation. Uh, yeah, but um, let me f look them up. So basically, you know, factions like the Kriks that are like mechanically undead uh, sort of faction that also are the edgiest motherfuckers that exist. Let me just um, pull up what uh, their yeah their poster looks like. Like you tell, like you look at that and you think. Um, a good guy can really exist in this. I think Death Guard, when I look at that. Oh, my God, the image is so yep. small. It does look so good. Hang on. Oh, here it yeah. is. Here yeah. is the... Hang on. PC, stop it. Damn technology. Yeah. Damn, yeah. I'm getting me milli. <laughs> yeah, but then there are... Um... Then there are factions that are a bit more gray, like Kator, that are basically uh, pre-Soviet Russia. So, of course, you have your... Um, uh, you, <laughs> you have um, some brutal characters, like the most famous one, the Butcher. Uh, I think I, I would describe him as, uh, like, Karn with... No, like Angron with far more restraint. It's not it hard to have sense. more restraint than Angron. No, no, not a rabid, really. No. A rabid dog has more restraint than Angron. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, as I said. But then there was. I mean, the good thing about this setting, I will say, is that not only is there a lot of factions, so you're absolutely spoiled for choice. You don't have to, you know, just patron your hold yourself to like Signar or like the main ones or anything like that. Uh, the good news is, it's also a roleplay setting, because there are things called mercenaries and minions. And mercenaries is basically uh, the war machine side of things, the Iron Kingdoms, where usually you are, you know, a bit more uh, human, you have... Uh, I mean, here's the thing, it's not like uh, 40k, where, uh, you know, every race just hates each other. There is, there is some people, you know, they can get along, you know, different races and stuff like that. You know, you can have... You can have a human, you can have an elf, you can have a trollkin, the blue guys. Uh, you can you can have those in a group. It's just that they are obviously, you know, the faction ones that are strictly their own. Yeah. But yeah, with mercenaries, you know, you can have you can go on adventures, you can uh, you know take out like a bad guy or something like all that kind of stuff. Then there's the minions, which is the flip side of the coins, that is hordes. And uh, just to make the distinction right now, War Machine tends to be always, the obviously um, uh, the steampunk uh, mechanical side of the hobby. And Hordes is the more, you know, magical monster side of the hobby. But it all happens in the same world. 
Right. So I, I figured that. as much as they're right alongside yeah. each other. Uh, yeah, 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 are they yeah, actually yeah. separate uh, games? Or well, is it actually, one game? No, it's more so just like how they're played because uh, monsters... I forget how... I, I completely forget. But basically, like... Uh, basically, the war jacks, the giant robots, they play a little bit differently to how the monsters are played. But otherwise, you can literally put both uh, things on the same table and uh, just play. So it, literally, but they, it is one game then. So if you can play them simultaneously. Yeah. All right. So yeah. Yeah. It so is. Yeah. so yeah, exactly. when thinking of War Machine and Hordes, one should not mm -hmm. think War Machine is one thing and Hordes is another. They're one and the same. They're just two exactly. sides of the same hobby. Yeah, and people tend to just call it War Machine anyway. So yeah. you know, I even mean, though I, that's mean, what I did yeah. at the beginning of the stream, I just I just know it as War Machine. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And uh, uh, Tail Green says uh, in War Machine there are people like Magnus the Traitor whose storyline is really great. I have not read that yet. I have only a few because, uh, like I said, it's a rather niche thing. It doesn't have um, the reach of say 40k. Sometimes you have to order strictly from Amazon, which is a pain in the ass for me. Which is saying a lot because technically speaking. Though it is getting close to being mainstream, it's not quite. 40k is still considered niche. Mm -hmm. So this True. is a niche. Uh, I, I I really hope that uh, War Machine does get more, like as from what little I've learned of it, not only from talking to you, but uh, just from mm -hmm. like residuals I've heard, like mm -hmm. for the last few years, a lot of people seem to really like War Machine. Uh, I know yeah. uh, a mutual friend of ours, Ollie, recently made <laughs> a uh, a video, a lore video, I think, talking about one yeah. specific character that's in War Machine. Yeah, I uh, just out of a whim, I needed someone to. That's the thing, because Ollie was actually looking for another hobby, and you know, I got him interested in War Machine Hearts, and I was like, eh, okay, I'll take a look. And then he actually now he knows more than me. That's how. <laughs> He left you in the dust. Yeah. <laughs> Later, better, fools. Better up your game, fool. <laughs> yeah. Or as Ollie would put it, you better up your game, fool. I'll bet. Mm, damn it. Yeah. Yeah, his oh, little yeah. ass totally, like, passed you. So, you better catch up. Oh. Completely, I swear. I'm teasing a friend uh, of mine on stream. I wonder how he'll react if he were if he were to watch. Oh, that's right. He doesn't watch my content. I can get away with it. <laughs> Man, they fuck it. Okay. All right, but yeah, I want. Yeah, I basically just wanted to do a little, uh, a little quick X. little introduction. I want. I will say. Um, I do hope we get more video games out of it eventually, because I want to. This is how any? niche it is. They have that yeah they do have one video game it's called war machine tactics and let's just say they had to kickstart that makes sense i mean it's a smaller smaller group that do war machine yeah. hordes so that, that that makes sense yeah 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 but yeah genuinely i do wanted to get more love and hey hopefully this will you know get you interested <laughs> I mean, okay. I will. I I'm definitely branching out more lately. I mean, I'm waiting on a. You know, Tiki was in earlier. I don't know if he's still here, but uh, I mm -hmm. I uh, did put in an order for a uh, a Conflict Forty Seven Army. Uh, it has mm -hmm. been delayed, and the I bought the starter set. I bought on eBay, but unfortunately, it seems to have yeah. bounced. So now yeah. I got to reorder a new one. This time, I'm going to buy straightly uh, straight from the manufacturer. Uh, yeah. but in the interim, you know, I'm also trying out Gunpla very soon. Like I just picked yeah. up a Zaku two and also picked up a, uh, yeah. I think it's, a. uh, shoot. I've never done Gunpla. That's the thing. I need to look into that myself. Gunpla is not a game. So I will say this, like the connect, uh, that, that's, this is why earlier I said, uh, and I don't know if you were here, I'm going to guess you weren't, but Gunpla is a cousin hobby. To something like 40k more so than it is like a sibling war machine horde sounds more like a sibling to 40k like there's some similar ideas the miniatures you know you still use for a game but whereas the only thing 
Gunpla has in common with something like 40k. As mm-hmm. far as I've researched, you know, I as as far as I know, there is no connection between uh Gunpla and any tabletop game at all because it's just not a tabletop game. They're purely collectibles and they're not even really mm-hmm. minis, they're figurines. Yeah, figurines, exactly. So it, that being said, though, a, a whole third of 40K as a hobby is the collecting and painting and the assembling, which mm. Gumpla has, so I'm counting it, but it's very loose. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's the same thing in War Machine where, you know, you have um, gray models and you get to paint them however you want. And actually, um, in some cases, they're actually very easier to assemble. Um I think the latest, uh, the latest actually, they're a brand new faction that I just posted uh, called the uh, Brine Blood Marauders and basically uh, Trollkin Pirates. So, yes, you can even have that. And the assembly is just literally just like, um, just put hand in this. Like, nothing, uh, you know, nothing overcomplicated. What's the price like, range you... uh, per, just generally speaking? What's the starter budget you would recommend not including paints starter or any like excess stuff like that just the models what's the uh, anything well if you're doing like a small squad game let's say um for a whole squad i mean i know that some individual individual models can um, be rather cheap uh they can be from well look i would say anything between uh three hundred dollars to maybe five hundred dollars uh well not well if you're like if you want to go for a whole army like a whole army like 40k but i mean two hundred dollars is uh for like a couple of uh, minis and maybe a giant um like heavy it could uh i mean it's somewhat reasonable more so than 40k sometimes i'm not even flinching when you say 200 like for me that makes sense yeah but uh yeah i mean yeah but anyway so that's uh that is that is about it i'm gonna eat my pizza now <laughs> yeah, fair enough thank you for coming on and being so enthusiastic i appreciate it yeah thank you always appreciate it thank you all right uh call rooms are empty yet again i'll share the link in chat it's also as always in the description of the stream if you'd like to come on and talk about your uh alternative and somewhat related hobby to 40k uh again for, it can be as loose as D and cyberpunk red or it can be as uh all, very similar as like hordes of war machine uh i welcome all you know if you could relate it to 40k go right ahead as long as it's a tabletop game but uh while i wait Anything I'm missing a chat. Karn showed up earlier. Oh, shit. Ah, oh, shit. I missed the start. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, I started uh, about 47 minutes. Oh, wow. It's already been 47 minutes. Damn. Time flew by. War, War Machine just got a new edition. Nice. What what number edition is it on, Telkri? Out of curiosity. Like, second edition, third edition. I don't know. I don't even know how old War Machine and Hordes is. To be fair. I think you're not too, too old. I don't recall hearing anything about it. Even 4th edition. Okay, so yeah, it's not too far in. Then again, I have no idea what the year separation is between the editions. I'm assuming they make 2 to 3 years per edition gap, roughly. So, it's at most a decade old. While I wait for another caller, uh, anyone in chat want to bring up a, uh, uh, other than the ones that have already been brought up, of course, anyone got another hobby they want to bring up? I mean, I can talk about Gumpla for a little bit, um, but I'm, I'm brand new to Gumpla, so I don't think I'm the right person to talk about it. <laughs> uh, as it is, I'm, I wouldn't necessarily say I'm, I'm getting into Gumpla properly. I'm, I'm going to be, because of the delay on the Conflict 47 army I ordered, I'm, uh, the Gunpla I ordered is just because I want to give it a shot and try it out, but those haven't even arrived yet, so. 
I have pretty much everything I need to paint the Gunpla, but uh, it has not arrived yet. So I, I don't think I'm the right person to speak on that. As, uh, I wouldn't even consider myself a Gunpla collector or fan quite yet. I'm open to becoming so, but eh, you know how it goes. It is from 2003. Oh, okay, so the gap between the editions is actually more significant. Okay. Yeah, because they're only on 4th edition, and it's been around since 2003? Yeah, it hasn't... Eh. means the gap between editions... Like, 1st edition, 2003, to 2023. 20 years later, it's only on 4th edition. At least there's a 5-year to 6-year gap in between each edition, I'm assuming. Which is the better way to do it, in my opinion. Uh, I think it, I think it's not... Uh, like One of my issues with, like, uh, GW, for example, is they barely refine an edition before they move on to the next one. Like, ninth edition was only just kind of getting good by the end when they started 10th edition, and 10th edition has a shit ton of fucking problems. Devastating Wounds being one of them. Ah... Uh, but I'm not going to, no, I'm not going to make this stream about fuck GW. Because honestly, that's not what this is about. This is, this stream is not me going, well, I'm done with GW, so give me alternatives that I'll start up. No, no, I'm still going to be playing 40k for a long time to come. Probably more so Horus Heresy than anything. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> this is just giving, uh, giving people, giving some spotlights to some lesser known alternatives that people may not have considered if they're, if they're not in the best of places with 40k right now, and not necessarily quit 40k, but maybe take a break, try something else out, see how they feel about it, kind of, you know, kind of have a sabbatical. <laughs> I don't even know if that's the right term, but you know, you know what I mean, like, uh, other alternatives. And I, I'm doing that with Conflict 47 in my own way, although I still have plenty of a pile of shame when I'm ready to go back to 40k, as always. Uh, and again, I'm trying out Gunpla as well because the Conflict 47 stuff is going to arrive in like a month as opposed to when I had hoped. <laughs> I apologize if you can hear my, my dog. She is very annoying. I love her to death, but she's annoying. Well, we got no callers, so I suppose I'll talk a little bit about my journey with Gunpla so far. Um, actually, what kind of gave me the idea to try Gunpla recently was I've been playing Armored Core 6. Oh, between 6 to 8 years per edition, and with around 3 to 4 expansions books per edition. That sounds pretty good. I mean, again, like, that, that sounds so ideal to me. Like take your time to refine an edition, really flesh it out before you move on to a new edition. If, if that's the mentality between the developers behind Hordes and War Machine, then they have the right mentality. That's what you should do. You shouldn't... Like, you should... Like, with first edition, you have no right to move on to second edition until you are... Ha until with what you did with first edition is the best you could do. Like, second edition shouldn't just be, uh, like, a marking stone of, oh, I'm starting, not maybe not necessarily starting over, but I'm starting fresh and kind of resetting some things and trying to improve upon past systems. No, no. First edition itself should be fixed, cleaned up, all that stuff. It should be so before you even release it. But, you know, obviously with community feedback, community experience, having played the games and so many different varieties, from there, you know, you refine first edition as you work your way through it and that's my hope with wargrave gothic is when i do the official first release of that game i'm not releasing until i'm 100 percent confident that the very at the bare minimum what i'm releasing is at least going to be a fun game to play with some neat miniatures that people are gonna you know get drawn into and the setting is gonna be very interesting you know that's that's my goal with that but i'm i'm not going to be moving on to like my like like mentality wise for me in my mind, if first edition comes out and people have problems with it, I don't care how minor they are. I'm gonna try and address them. As, and when I say minor, of course, I it's community wide, right? Like if one person complains about one specific rule in the game, and then everybody else is okay with it, then I'm not gonna obviously address that. But if the community has like some general issues, I'd address them. And I wouldn't feel right moving on to second edition until I'd address those issues and made first edition a full, complete, 
healthy package that people will enjoy on its own. And then with second edition, like experiment, add new systems, maybe tweak existing ones, play around with it, give it its own identity, and also progress the story. Yeah, that that's be my mentality, and I'm I'm kind of uh, it definitely makes me want to check out War Machine and Hordes all the more, knowing that they have that mentality seemingly with their own property, their own IP. Because if they're taking that many years just to work on and add to the current edition they've been running with, then that sounds like to me they they have the right idea about things. Of course, I might be biased, but that's me. Uh, suppose, uh, yeah. So with armored, uh, having been playing armored core, I gave uh, a try to gunpla. Uh, I'm giving a try to gunpla because a lot of the things that people have been saying, like while I've been playing armored core from like other YouTubers and stuff, is a lot of people have brought up that uh, oh, uh, you know this is the gun gu Gundam game I always wanted. Like this is the Gundam game I always I always wanted to see and play and experience, which for me was weird because. To be quite frank, I know I knew absolutely nothing about Gundam. I knew it existed, but I don't know how you don't know Gundam exists. It's like one if you're if you've engaged in anime whatsoever, you've at least heard the name Mobile Suit Gundam, at least once. And with Gundam, you know, after playing Armored Core, with so with with so many people saying it reminded them or they felt like they were finally playing a Gundam game, it kind of threw me off because I always considered Gundam and what always made me avoid it was I always thought like the, it was like Power Rangers but full on like 2D animation as opposed to live action with a guy in a suit. Like all the clips and images I'd ever seen from like the anime that was always my assumption. I mean this big cartoony colorful mech that that's fighting in space and doing all this Power Rangers shit. So I, I totally wrote it off but with you know our people mentioning it during Armored Core, and I even uh, I even uh, can't remember the YouTubers comment section, but I even like threw out the the query, is like, is it just the mech part, the mobility, like is it just that? And they're like, no no no, like everything about it reminds me of of Gundam. It's like, really? It's it's such a dark tone, like it's it, it's not cartoony. And they're like, well, you've clearly never watched Gundam, and I went, you're right, I haven't. I know Jack! <laughs> so that led me to looking into gun Gunpla and like the actual Gundam collectibles just because out of curiosity and what actually sold me on giving it a shot for like maybe a video or two and picking up some and trying it out was it's so fucking cheap. Like I, I envy Gunpla like hardcore Gunpla nerds so hard right now because when I looked up Gunpla, <laughs> they're like 30 bucks. In current economy, 30 bucks on Amazon. And there's like two other websites I checked out. Uh, like one's like, a, you know, uh, America, Gun Gundam, whatever the fuck. And <laughs> I was like, are you kidding me? This high grade, and I do know the grade system, by the way. I know, you know, low grade, high grade. Master grade, perfect grade. I, I know about the grade system, but I, the one I like, the ones I was looking at, I was like, th this this collectible high grade that's from that new Witch of Mercury show is thirty bucks. Thirty for something that's twice the size uh, of a it's twice the size of a dreadnought for forty k, and it has articulation. It can move. It's an action figure. Right, it's it, it's not a it's not a frozen in place mini. It's an articulated figure that you have to assemble, and it comes pre-colored, by the way, not pre-painted, but pre-colored plastic. So you don't even have to paint it, and you don't have to glue it, cause it snaps together, cause it's an action figure. It's meant to be disassembled and reassembled and articulated and moved around. You don't have to glue it. So the painting is uh, is entirely optional. The assembly is easy as shit. And it, it comes pre-colored and all of that and it's infinitely cheaper than anything in 40k. 
30 bucks for the for uh, the Mercury kit I picked up, which I think is like the Calidus or Cal Calibran or whatever the heck it was called. I don't know. I picked it at random. It looked the coolest out of the ones I want to pick. And I also picked up a Zaku 2. Like, those are the two I picked up. And I'm waiting for it to be delivered as we speak. And I was just taken aback. Oh, welcome, Trinity Outsider and just now Temporary Alien. Welcome. I started with Gunpla and now I have about 300 plus kits to build. Jesus. Yeah, I'm still waiting on the two kits I've initially ordered. Or, but the thing is, you said 300 plus kits to me and we were talking about 40k. I'd be like, are you fucking kidding me? What the hell? <laughs> like, you must be a rich man. But you tell me 300 kits with with Gundam, I still think you have money. Like, you, like obviously, you've had, you had to have had some to order all those. But I'm a lot less impressed by that number. Not to down, not to downgrade it, by the way. I, I am still impressed by that number. But I'm less impressed than I would have been. Because I always thought, and this was my thing when I first like looked into it because of Armored Core. When I was Googling them, I had no intention of actually picking up a Gunpla model or giving it a shot. I only looked it up because people were telling me, oh, it reminds me just of Gundam and this, that, the other. I was like, okay. And I looked up the kits just out of curiosity. And when I saw they were so cheap, that's what made, like, opened me up to decide to pick them up. But, th yeah, 30 bucks. And the Zaku 2 I picked up was, like, 14 bucks. These are really cheap as shit kits. And I was, I was amazed. It's like... You're telling me I can get something that's two dreadnoughts, like, stacked on top of each other for 30 bucks. Fucking A, man. <laughs> and I get to paint it and assemble it. Uh, so, yeah, I'm planning on doing a video on that, so be on the lookout for that. It's gonna be, it's gonna be more than a mini, or, I guess it's not a mini. Uh, it's gonna be more than a figure painting video. It's going to be a deep dive into Gundam. That's a video that's uh, upcoming. Not, it's not like I'm going to be like reviewing every episode or some shit like that. I'm going to give a general hobby explanation, talk about like why people collect Gunpla, where it stems from, talk about the different uh, timelines in the Gunpla, Gundam anime, where everything origins from, and I'm even right now so I can do it justice and so I can really do a proper deep dive on the Gundam hobby. I'm actually watching the uh, UC timeline, the original timeline Gundam series, which is, uh, I just, I finished the origin anime for Char, uh, the Red Comet. I finished that, and that was amazing. I know that anime was made in 2015, I know it's a prequel, but I finished that, watched that because it's chronologically the earliest entry, and then I've just... I'm on episode 5 or 6 right now of Mobile Suit Gundam, the 1979 original anime, where the whole hobby and the whole Gunpla craze comes from. And I owe, I owe an apology to Gundam fans, because for years I've known about Gundam and I've always written it off, because I just thought it was Power Rangers, but animated. And by the time I f first heard about it, I, I considered myself too old for Power Rangers, like, I was like, ah, that's just cheesy fights and, like, really, you know, over-the-top, dorky, you know, anime moments. I, I, I saw it as weeb, a weeb's weeb anime, you know? <laughs> like, as much as I love anime, I always saw it as, as that. And I wrote it off. But now that I've finished that prequel anime, which was super serious, I felt like I was watching Game of Thrones in space with mechs. Like, it was far more serious than I, th I, I, I thought. So I was like, what the fuck? And it even almost got me to cry like twice, like two or three times. And now that I'm on with the, uh, uh, the actual, uh, time, the actual original anime, you know, it, it's still serious. Like I thought maybe with the transition from that, that prequel to what I was going to be watching, it was going to be the seriousness, a little bit of it would be robbed. Nah, I'm on episode five and shit's still serious. I mean, it's not anywhere near as overbearing as a dark of a tone or as intricate i don't know if i'm phrasing these things correctly then uh then the red comet origin anime was but it for its time it's actually very dark and very serious and i've been i've been i've been very impressed with it i can definitely see why people have fallen in love with with such a thing, and I can I, I could see the 
after like the fifth or sixth episode of seeing the Zakus and the fighting with the Gundam, I'm like, you know what? I get wanting to collect these because while I was watching it, my hands were just fidgeting because I was like, I kind of, I kind of want to be like assembling and painting a Gundam right now. <laughs> I think I know where this love comes from. It's, it's malicious, but it's genius. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, like, like I said, uh, that's that's a recent thing that's going to be upcoming uh, on the channel, is my foray into Gunpla. I, I don't promise by any stretch that it's going to be a regular a thing on the channel. I don't promise I'm becoming a proper Gunpla representative. I'm not, I, I can't promise I'm getting into the hobby to that extent. But I've got two Gunpla models and a whole deep dive to do. It's going to take a while to do the video, though. To do it justice, anyway. And plus, I still got to finish the rest of Mobile Suit Gundam. The original show. I'm not watching every single series. I'll I'll lose my mind. <laughs> I'll lose my goddamn mind. I'll go insane. But I've been enjoying it thus far. A lot more than I thought I would, to be honest. Uh, if I have to admit it. You're only just getting into it. I plan to make dioramas with Gunpla. I mean, yeah, you definitely can. I mean, I, I, the flexibility with Gunpla is like model kits and like actually like painting them and stuff like that. It's it's a lot more flexible than... That's the timeline I... I, I Zerat, I, I, I take it you're just joining now. That's the timeline I'm watching. I'm watching the original. Yeah, because I... I to... Gimme. No way. Did it just arrive? Because it's on the table. That is too timely. That's scary. Because I was just talking about a gumpla. And this feels like it's it feels like it's the box. Okay. Okay. Dude, I what the fuck? <laughs> Holy shit. Okay, I think the mailman's stalking me. Okay, you can't write this shit. It just arrived. <laughs> oh, dude. Yeah, it arrived. It arrived sooner than the Zaku I ordered. Like, the Zaku I ordered, I ordered before this. Dude, that, that's fucking crazy. That's actually kind of scary. I got, I'm going to block my windows now and soundproof this place because now I'm just going to look out the window at night afraid my the f <laughs> afraid FedEx is just... Is he talking about it yet? Which Gunpla is it? Uh, the uh, Gundam Calabarn from the Witch from Mercury series. I, I just picked one that I thought looked cool. Uh, from like Amazon. Like I said, it was a completely random pick, and I picked it before I'd even started watching the anime. So I, I don't, e I didn't even know like any of the different Gundams. Uh, the Zaku I picked because I actually started to find out what that was. So yeah, I don't know if it's in frame. Hold on. Yeah, there we go. Gundam Calabarn. Uh, I don't know how people feel about the Witch for Mercury, and I haven't seen that show. I'm still watching uh, through the uh, uh, the original timeline uh, again with the is that the UC timeline Universal Century right and then timeline I think it I think it is uh, yeah Universal Century the original yeah. Yeah, that's the one I, I'm watching through right now. You see, it's not part of Witch of Mercury. Yeah, no, I, I know, I know. I didn't, I, I did, again, I picked this at random. I didn't pick, I did not pick it because it's part of the timeline I'm watching. I, I picked it because it, it looked cool. <laughs> I, I picked the Gundam before I started watching the show. So, uh, again, uh, I'll say it one more time. I, this was picked at random. <laughs> The Zaku was picked. Uh, the Zaku was picked specifically because I thought I was. I had been watching the Origin show, the Red Comet Origin, and now I'm watching through. Uh, now I'm watching through Mobile Suit Gundam proper, 
the original 1979 show. <clears throat> so I, I'm, I'm aware that Witch for Mercury is its own timeline. I don't know, if, is it one of the standalones? Because I know that on top of there being different timeline shows, there's also standalone shows that don't connect to a wider timeline. I know there's that. The origin is not canon to the original show. Uh, the Red Comet show? I mean, I can't see why it wouldn't be. Jeez, there's a fly, what the hell? I can't see why it wouldn't be. I mean, to be fair, I'm only four or five episodes into Mobile Suit Gundam, but... Everything I've watched in Mobile Suit Gundam proper through Episode 5 directly complements the origin, or the co I guess the origin would complement the the original show. Uh, nothing has count contradicted anything I've learned between the two. So if it isn't canon, it's eerily fitting if it was. But uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't know that I'm new to this. But as as far as, as far as I've experienced, it, they connect to each other just fine. I'll let you know when there's contradictions. I took notes. Uh, well, Zara, I don't know if you know. Like, I I take it. Have you even watched the original show? Because there weren't the federation didn't have mobile suits in that show either in uh in the red now not to spoil it for anybody who hasn't seen it but the red comet origin show the f the only people who had mobile suits were was was zion or zeon they they were the only ones in the show that had mobile suits the feds didn't have mobile suits they barely had ships to work with as it was, and they were getting their asses kicked. So, uh, if that's your point of separation, then the show agrees with you. Yeah, but uh, in the uh, the gun tank point, the <laughs> I, I on episode one or two of the Mobile Suit Gundam show. The feds have gun tanks as well, or mech-like tanks. Those count as mobile suits? Uh, so far, the show disagrees with you. They haven't referred to them as mobile suits. And in the original, because in the... I'm watching through it fresh. I can only tell you what I, I've watched. And for what I've watched, what I've watched disagrees with what you are saying to me right now. Because in the origin, they made a point to say that what the uh, what the feds had that was a mimic mimicry of it, of the mobile suits, the Zakus, weren't mobile suits. The researcher, the father of the main character from uh, Mobile Suit Gundam, uh, in the origin show, he even yell. Yeah, there's actually kind of a meme -y moment in one of the later episodes where he sees th what they're attempting to make to mimic the mobile suits. He even yells, that's not a mobile suit. And then when they actually deploy them, they get their asses handed to them because they're not mobile suits. And then we actually never see them use those again. I think those were prototypes that got destroyed. So, as for gun tanks... Um, those are in the original show. Uh, in episode one or two, I'm pretty sure it was episode one, these uh, Zeon uh, Zakus arrive on the colony where the main character and his dad and the and the Gundam are, are and they're loading stuff onto the fed ship and several of the very first things the Zeon mobile suits Zakus destroy were gun tanks or were you know the mech like little tank things so those are in the original show so again everything i've viewed up to this point disagrees with what you're telling me in chat including the point about saying that the gun tanks count as mobile suits 
Because literally the show looks at what what the feds had for prototypes, and they literally say in the show those aren't mobile suits. So I again I can only go based on what I've seen and experienced so far, and it disagrees with what you're telling me. The original novel, there's no gun tanks. I don't know anything about the original novel. I can only speak to the show. Uh, and again, Zerat, I'm watching the original. I'm not just talking about the Red Comet origin show. I'm also talking about the original show, which I am currently watching. And uh, unless that is clarified in a later episode... I'm only up to six. Everything from episode one to six establishes that those aren't mobile suits. And the and the tanks that they have are were mech like tanks that the Zaku's destroyed. I'd pull it up, but I don't want YouTube to take down my stream. And Japan are not exactly uh what's the word? Generous with their IP. <laughs> So, I, again, I, I can only say that what you're telling me doesn't align with what I've watched up till now. But yeah. Fitting, this arrived just in time. And creepily while it was live. Which was weird. Kind of has a lot of spin-offs. That, I know. <laughs> uh, that's actually the first thing people warned me about when I was going around saying I was going to try and get into it is... People are like, oh, which timeline? I'm like, what? And people send me screenshots of all the different timelines there are. Apparently there's like, what, six or seven? Let's see. Uh, there's Universal Century, Future Century, After Colony. They chose some poor colorations for this graphic. Hold on. Uh, Cosmic ERM? E Cosmic Erm? What? I can't read that font. Uh, Cosmic ER something. Uh, let's see, that's UC, FC, AC, CE, uh, AD, Anno, Anno Domini? Domini? Okay. Uh, AW, After War, AG, Advanced Generation. Uh, wait, there's two Anno Domini? Domini? Now I'm even more confused, because that they're, they're labeled separate, but what? Okay, yeah, even looking at the graphic that's meant to try and explain their differences is confusing me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because there's two AD, ADs now. There's Anno Domini and... Anno Domini. I don't know how they differ. Okay, and then there's PD, Post Disaster, and AS, Ad Stella. And I take it that Witch for Mercury is the newest one. So add that to the list, unless that doesn't count. Or unless that counts as part of one of the ones I've already named off. But yeah, I, I haven't seen this show. Uh, I'm, I am finished the Red Comet origin story, and I'm up to uh, episode 6 of Mobile Suit Gundam. And I'm planning on putting together this bad boy, as well as the Zaku 2, and uh, making a video all around that, talking about the hobby, the origins of it. It's going to be a chunky video, at least I'm going to... I'm going to try and condense it, of course, to be watchable, but it's upcoming. I gotta, f I gotta finish Mobile Suit Gundam before I feel comfortable talking about it. Now, obviously, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert just because I finished up through Mobile Suit Gundam, the show. Because even within the UC uh, timeline, I know there's multiple different shows. At least I believe there are, if not movies and compilation films and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, I know there's a lot to it, but that's, that's the absolute minimum I want to go through to at least talk about like a, a beginner's journey into Gunpla. Oh, my neck. Mm. 
uh, AD one is zero zero Gundam with with is a version of Gundam that happens in the future of our timeline ish. Oh, okay, so I guess that's the difference. Scratch that. Anno Domini two is build fighters. Oh. Yeah, uh, I feel I feel like you need a PhD to to <laughs> fully fully master and understand the timeline differences between the Gumpla. <laughs> okay, I didn't. Know, I apologize to everyone who's tuning in. By the way, who who hopped in hoping to get different 40k alternatives instead. <coughs> the last like half hour has been nothing but gun. <laughs> Uh, that's, uh, that is kind of funny, though. Ah! Gun of is the only true... Okay, we're gonna start a... We're gonna start a, a war... A, uh, what do you what do you call that? Uh, a flame war in the chat. <clears throat> Man. I'm gonna kill my... <laughs> oh, my God. But yeah. Uh, the kid arrived. So I suppose that makes actually doing the video now easier. Oh yeah, by the way, like, for, I, I am, like, gonna paint that, by the way. Like, I... The amount of preparation I've done for something I don't think I'm gonna turn into a full hobby is kind of scary. Uh, I, I bought a bunch of skewers and uh, alligator clips as well as styrofoam boards to stab these into so I can properly air air prime uh, the components so I can paint them. I, I even bought a uh, mobile air air uh, airbrush, which uh, will be interesting to try out. Yeah, I know a, pro a proper airbrush kit it has a compressor and, and stuff like that, but I wanted... To get a slightly cheaper alternative, especially since I don't know how much I'm going to get into this, and when it comes to my 40k stuff, I normally hand paint it. But, uh, yeah, I picked up a airbrush kit, the mobile version. I I'm sure it will have a lot of limitations because of that, because it has a battery thing compressor. But, worth a shot, if nothing else. Bought a shit ton of this and spent, like, 30 minutes while watching a couple episodes of the Gundam show... Connecting the skewers to the alligator clips so I can clip on different components and spray them. Uh, I've also got a bunch of like the, you know, airbrush necessary equipment like the cleaner or the flow improver. Yeah, I'm, I'm about to put myself, th I'm putting myself, again, I'm putting, <laughs> I made a, I'm putting myself through a lot. There's something I don't even know if I'm going to get into that hardcore. <laughs> For content, not not not, not even really. <laughs> so for other alternative things, I can also recommend having a look at Infinity by Cor Corvus Belly. It is a de decent sci-fi skirmish game uh, akin to 40k Kill Team. All their rules and builder is free. Ooh. I will have to look that up right now. Uh, Infinity. Infinity. But I should type it exactly how you wrote it. Uh, capital N. Infinity. Tabletop. Game. Corvus belly, right? Well, those are neat looking. Pull up that image. Yeah, this is a sample image of some of the minis from Infinity. They look cool. Yeah, looks solid. 
So any other examples? Very Tao-esque, that particular one. Kind of rogue tradery vibes from these guys. Eh. Certainly looks interesting. I'll have to research it a bit more. But it looks cool. Thank you for the uh, recommendation, Delker. Much appreciated, lad. Much indeed, much indeed. I'll just leave that there. I kind of have no words to put. <laughs> ah! Uh, G Gundam is Street Fighter in Gundams. What? With Mexico using some sombrero Gundam nacho. Okay, maybe my first impression of Gundam back when I was a kid was the correct impression. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe, maybe I had it right. Maybe I, maybe I pegged it right, and I'm just thinking I pegged it wrong because the Universal Universal Century timeline is tricking me. <laughs> but yeah, ignoring the origin uh, anime, the prequel anime of the Red Comet, because I guess it's up in the air if that's canon or not. Uh. I'd have to clarify. I, I thought I saw someone in one of the waiting call rooms. Is someone there? Please come back. I'll pull you in. Ah, goose. Hello? Hello. Welcome. How are you, my friend? I'm okay. I heard you talking about the greatness that is G Gundam. I mean... I didn't bring it up, they brought it up. <laughs> the chat. Oh, G Gundam is just... You have to watch it to just... Oh, it's just that perfect type of early 90s Japanese racism. <laughs> what? Yeah. Yeah. Like, every nation in the world submits a mobile suit to fight in this giant great tournament and... <clears throat> The American Gundam is literally a football styled after a football player that has a giant six shooting revolver and oh yeah, his shoulder pads become boxing gloves. <laughs> like it, 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 it's just off the walls. What Japan thinks the rest of the world thinks Japan thinks that they are. It's just bonkers. <laughs> like the Brazilian Gundam it, it is just a torso on a tightrope. Oh, God, that sounds beautiful just in concept. Oh, God, it is so ridiculous. Like, uh, one of my favorite Gundam from Africa, the Zulu Gundam. It's just a Zulu warrior that looks like a mecha. It is just... Oh, the Danish Windmill Gundam. Or the John Bull Gundam from England that has the large hat of the English guards. <clears throat> uh, or better yet, the, the the German Gundam that has the 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 Schwitzhelm on and, you know, is just all black and orange and red. Or the Bolt Gundam that looks like he has a Yashanka on. Just It's just batshit insane. I'll definitely have to put it at the top of my list after I finish Mobile Suit. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, and going to Mobile Suit. Mobile Suit Gundam The Origin is a retelling of the original Mobile Suit. So, just a clarification. Are you talking about the Red Comet Origin one from 2015? The, the, all, all of the Origin technically is quote-unquote canon because it's supposed to be all in that timeline. It's just bringing it up to um, modern animation standards standards because the original Gundam is it's janky it's horribly janky I mean I'm six episodes in I'm listening I'm, wa I'm listening uh, I'm watching the English dub uh and I I have a feeling the dub I'm listening to was uh was a redub because the audio quality 
of like what I'm hearing is really crisp. Like it does not sound like something that was recorded in the 1970s or 80s even. Oh no, dude, Gundam wasn't dubbed until the late 80s. Yeah. And brought I, over. I figured as much. Like it didn't sound like the like just compare like the opening song of Mobile Suit Gundam. That sounds 70s. But the moment the characters start talking, I'm like well, that sounds way too crisp to be bad, 70s. bad Japanese 80s film basically you know where the mouse are moving but then you hear them start talking well it's not, it's not even like it's it's not that it's, it's not synced well it, it's just the quality is really good like strikingly so so it, it's very clear they it wasn't the it, the dub was not recorded even mm -hmm. within the same decade as the anime's release see the the Gundam invasion didn't happen until 1994 and then that was with the boy band gundam boy band gundam mobile suit gundam wing which is a boy band gundam four gundams are sent to earth to overthrow the earth sphere alliance wing gundam sandrock gundam heavy arms my favorite because you know fucking daka shinrock and uh death sight and they are all teenage boys. That's why I call it the boy band Gundam. Yeah, but they're not like actually like just going to concerts and singing like a boy band, right? No, 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 no. Okay. no the people die. Okay. Oh, a lot of people die. There's murder. But, yeah. but uh, yeah, it's just weird. Uh, the and chat, then the chat is saying five. New Mobile Gundam Wing, 5 Gundam. Not sure what that... Yeah, that's what I said. Oh. Wing Gundam, Heavy Arms, Sandrock, Death Sight, and uh, the Shenlong Gundam. Zero would be six. You know, get... Zero was built after Wing was destroyed. You know, it's too late for me to turn back now, but I'm just saying I'm kind of thinking this was a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you start in Gundam, and I love it. I yeah I I I was shocked by how much I loved the Red Comet origin anime and like I said I, I, I've I thought it would yeah, be really you're... really rough transferring from that to the original seventy nine show but so far six episodes in the worst part about the show is just the <sighs> animation it it holds up as well as it can but it's got the, problems the story the story will hold up. Hey, a story holds up. But so it will get the animation will get jankier before it gets better. Yeah. Um, you know, you're gonna meet some of the best characters Gundam ever have. Honestly, Shar Aznable, uh Rambaral, the uh Black Tri Stars. Just so many great characters. And, you know. And uh but the best one will always be PTSD in a mobile suit, and that is the 08th MS team. That is the best one. It's 13 episodes long. It was supposed to go longer, but unfortunately the director passed away, so they ended it. Um, and it's mobile suits fighting in Vietnam, basically. These giant mobile suits are fighting in Southeast Asia. During the one-year war. Interesting. Um, then you got the show that is just pure depression. 0080, War in the Pocket. That That's a hard watch. You have to be in the right frame of mind to watch that one. In my point of view. It's it's very hard. Yeah, I mean, uh, a theme I've, I've caught up on pretty early with Gundam, at least, again, going by the original timeline I've been watching, uh, it's uh, it's a anti-war show, but in the way shows that were anti-war back in the day were. Like, it's not anti-war by preaching at you how bad it is 24-7. <coughs> it's more, we're showing you a war show with awesome action and cool stuff. We're entertaining you first. But the theme that all of this sucks and it's not a happy time is there as well. 
the the way I see Gundam is I see it more as an anti Bushido code um uh, thing because if you you watch if you watch Gundam you'll see you know the Battle of the Solomon Sea you know the the fact that the Earth sphere or the the Earth gets overwhelmed and their navy's destroyed by these newfangled mobile suits doesn't doesn't sound like anything aircraft destroying a fleet at anchor maybe yeah it, it I always saw mobile suit Gundam as a retelling of Japan's side of the World War. The Second World War. Because a lot of the places are named after the places that a lot of naval bases happen. Like the Battle of Solomon. Uh, you're going to get that way later, but you know I'm not spoiling anything. The obvious the fascistic tones in Xeon. But, I mean... Uh, yeah, it's pretty overt. <laughs> like my the biggest thing is the in the origin, and I I know I'll reference that a bit. And again, I know that uh, Zara brought up in the chat that it's, I, from how he put it, it's straight up not canon. But you know, it might be kind of sort of canon, might not be. But based on what I've watched so far, nothing contradicts the official UC timeline so far. So until it does, I'm, I'm just going to treat it as canon. But the flags in that f during the Xeon uh, rebellion, uh, it, it's it's definitely meant to invoke a certain feeling. And it's the red and black flags with the focus on the s the center with the symbol in a circle. Take out the symbol and just replace it with the swastika, and it's yeah, it's, with it's the bent running man. It's just one to one. <laughs> it's. So it's pretty over. Yeah. The the thing with Origin, like with all this stuff, because the Rise of the Red Comet and all that whatnot, is canon, but it was never put to paper. It was mostly in audio dramas that were never really translated and came over. Fans translated them and brought them over. It, it, it's weird. Weird thing with Gundam canonicity is some things are canon, some things aren't. Some things can fit. Like one of my favorite things right now is Mobile Suit uh, Gundam Thunderbolt. Just because th the movie was just nonstop action, and I thought that was really cool. Plus, they like heavily armed suits. But it takes place in the UC timeline, but it's not canon to the UC timeline. You're going to run into that problem really big with can Gundam. Because everything is canon, and yet nothing is canon. I mean, there, there are set points that will be there permanently. But it, it's... It, it's very hard to understand the it, it, timeline. Because you have the manga timeline. Then you have the show timeline. Then you have the book timeline. Then you have the movie timeline. And it's just really hard to work everything in together. So they just sort of exist as their own separate thing. Then there's the standalone <laughs> shows that don't connect to one of the wider timelines that are self-contained. <clears throat> yeah. Um, <clears throat> there is only one show that is meant to wrap up all of the end of Gundam. And that is Turn A Gundam. And that's supposed to be at the end, the very last of all the Gundam timelines is supposed to be Turn A. And that is really weird. I won't ask too many details about that one. It, it, because in that one, you'll see suits that show up, and it's really, really weird. <laughs> well, temporary alien agrees with what I'm thinking right now. <laughs> Timelines hurt my brain. Yeah, there's there's yeah a lot of complexity clearly. But I think it's and like, then yeah, and then, then you fun. have the one offs. Like G Gundam was to sell toys. It was the '80s toy drive, basically, just like GI Joe and uh, uh, Robotech and. Uh, um, she-Hulk and all that whatnot, or not She-Hulk. 
And I brew, uh, yeah, corn, I, yeah. Turn A is stupid because it hurts my brain. And half the time you can't tell if the main character is female or male. They say she's male, but then at other times it's just, it hurts your brain. Because of the original Japanese, sometimes they're voiced by a dude and sometimes they're voiced by a female. It hurts your brain to listen to in the original Japanese. Uh, Trini Outsider, we got Gundam Heavy Armor, uh, blah, blah, blah. Remember, Gundam also has no good or bad side. EFF committed some war crimes and Xeon was all about dropping colonies on Earth. Yeah, I, 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 I get that. And that, that goes along with the theme, though, of war, uh, of an anti-war film. It, it's not, because the thing is, I wouldn't consider a film anti-war if it makes one side wholly good or bad. Because at that point, you're establishing that war is good because one side is in the right and is fighting for something that is therefore justifying the war. If you want to make an anti-war film, you need to establish that there isn't a justification for what's going on, not a proper one. Well, it, and that's the thing. With Xeon, you could see they had points. Oh, yeah, they wanted... That like, they, want, they wanted independence. Yeah, I mean, it, they, their situation is very similar to America's, right? Like, they are... They they are uh, away from Earth. They are not really subject to it, and anyone and the Federation making legislation for them when the Federation don't really have jurisdiction on them or don't really experience things the way they see it. They're just a far away off government. It's very comparable to uh, to America, and obviously it's with a darker twist, where like the principality, the sovereign, the authoritarian elements to them but they're there's good with the bad they're bad just like the feds are because they're willing to commit awful evil acts in the name of s establishing their superiority and control including yes yeah, dropping a colony on earth and that being the, this great devastation yeah, but that's the like colony a million nukes drop is a lot more fucked up I mean, yeah, they, I, I, trust me, I, 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 I just, I said that multiple times when watching the episode. Yeah, but did you know that colony ha still had its full population? Yeah, they show it right in the origin anime. Like they show you okay. the, they show you the population. I forgot, I forgot about that in the ori origin. They, they show you the fact that Xeon gassed them. I yeah, forgot yeah. about that. They, they, they gas them and make it look like a winter, a uh, snow's coming, coming in, and. Before they even do that, they completely, using their mobile suits, covered their whole colony in, like, sheets. So you couldn't see inside of it, and they couldn't see outside of it, so they didn't know what was happening. And, then, yeah, they they killed all of them on the inside and then dropped the colony with its full complement. And what's even more twisted is, right before all that happened, two of the members of said colony that they dropped on Earth were talking about how, when all that stuff was over, that they couldn't wait to go and visit Japan on Earth together. Oh uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They they yeah. really like fueled it up. <laughs> like I knew it was coming, uh, not because I knew the plot. Again, I don't know the. I I'm learning the story as I watch. One of the benefits of watching a show this old and having avoided it, like, and, and I do mean that I've been avoiding it. It's been in my crosshairs numerous times, but I've always avoided it because I wrote it off as Power Rangers, but animated. And I always thought it was cool. You, for you it. could really call. Um... Gundam Wing kind of Power Rangers because you have that weird boy band thing going. I mean, probably, but so far with the original Mobile Suit Gundam show and the Origin show I watched, no, nah, that is what's well, one of the most insulting things I ever thought. As a, like now watching it, I kind of want to slap my my younger self from the back of the head. It's like you have no idea what you missed, you dumbass. <laughs> you could have been watching yeah, the show for my, years. My... <laughs> My personal favorite out of everything will always be Double Eighty Three, just because it's one of those that has enough episodes to tell a story, and it's just, just really good. Plus, it gives me my favorite suit, the the Dom Tropin. Uh, and yes, Karn, it's Tropin, not Tropin. Uh, Gilly guy, hey, welcome. I just hopped in onto the stream. Any callers do Turnip Twenty Eight yet? No. What the hell is Turnip Twenty Eight? I don't know. That's the first one. Uh, we've had people go over War Machine and Hordes. Uh, War Machine and Hordes. I almost said gasoline. Uh, not gasoline. Um, 
Crap, I wrote it down, didn't I? Shit, no I didn't. Um, <laughs> kerosene, I think. Eh. <laughs> Crap. I'll scroll up, I'm cheating. I should've wrote it down. I meant to, <laughs> I'm sorry. Tiki brought it up, oh, I feel so dumb. Gaslands and uh, Carnival. Yeah, I I don't know why I, <laughs> I fucked that up. I'm sorry. I gotta write them down. E. Uh, yeah. War Machine and Hordes. Uh, uh, that. <laughs> oh my god, that is not good. I I, I look away and it's gone. <laughs> that's, that's a bad day. Uh, Gaslands and Carnival. <laughs> uh. Bolt Action, Conflict 47. Uh, and technically, we also went to D&D &D and a few other things. Oh, he's in the call. You and I will talk more about Gundam later, Caboose. All right, brother. Thanks for coming on. Bye. Bye. I'm not saying that we're done talking about it this stream. It's likely going to come back up. But I, I want to give Gilly Guy the floor. Gilly Guy, can you hear me? Hey. How you doing? So what is good, good. uh what is what is it turnip twenty eight? Yeah, yeah. So um it's what happens when a Kriegsman and an orc have a baby that then falls to Nargle. What? Um <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So uh, I guess the I, I guess I'll start with um the whole project is started as like an artist on the internet and uh people do it mostly as like kind of art project, but then they start making rules for it so you can play games with them. The uh the core concept is it's in a a like alternative future where roots a bizarre rooty growth has taken over the earth, is mutating everything, and all that stuff is a field of mud and um, people fighting over root vegetables which they worship. Sounds grim dark. Yeah, yeah. It's um like I said, it's kinda got a lot of that kind of like it's got a lot of humor to it, you know, along with that kind of over laid on top of that really like dark subject matter of like um, when you read about the setting, you feel like you're reading about the last days of humanity and everyone's kind of like too crazy and stupid to really notice or care because they're fighting over carrots. Yeah. Hold on. Let me and, I pull up some images of it real quick. I'll share it with stream. I mean, the aesthetic a, l a little bit reminds me of, uh, reminds me a bit of colonial era, like clothing. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, um, the divergent in the timeline is supposed to be after the, the uh, Napoleonic Wars. So that's kind of like the, I guess, as far forward as the technology goes for the most part. They are working on adding in tanks, though, to the game. It's um, it's still kind of like under constant develop. I think they're working with one page rules to they're come work, up with some stuff. They're working on wait. They're working with one page rules or, or on, uh, to my to my knowledge, I'd have to double check. Actually, let me double check on that. I might be wrong. I mean, if that's the case, <laughs> good choice. I mean, good crew. It is a it is a very simple rule set. So. Uh, I, I think my favorite thing about the rule set that I've noticed is that um, because it's predominantly an art project first and a game second, the um, all the base sizes are like a suggested range. So it's like it, it might be something like you know twenty to thirty millimeter, you know. And um, if you put multiple dudes on a base, just use wound tokens, you know. So it's it's really really open to just do what you want, you know. And be a good sport. I mean, it sounds by the sounds of it, it's still early on in its uh, existence. Yeah, yeah, it's. Um, I think it's just like a. I, I believe it started after the pandemic. It is not from the before times, so. I, I wonder how much the pandemic might have influenced it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, there is a kind of, uh, I guess, melancholy to it, the whole thing. I mean, yeah, say what you will about the pandemic. Uh, I guess one positive you could take away is it depressed people so much they started making their own products. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of, like, uh, there's a lot of, like, humor to it. Um, I think one of my favorite things people like to do is to do art art pieces where you just see, like, a helmet with these little stumpy legs walking around. 
And uh, if you have no idea what's under it, it could be a, a walking root, talking root, vegetable for all you know. There's actually or it could be just yeah. There's something the imagery of it uh, is reminding me of. Um, have you seen Jim Henson's The Labyrinth? Oh, I'm I'm, kind of, I'm familiar with the dude with the eyes on his hands. That's from that, right? Uh, no, uh, that sounds like Pan's Labyrinth. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, well, if you it, it, for everyone in the chat and for you, uh, Jim Henson's uh, The Labyrinth was a uh, dark fantasy, uh, for the most part, a dark fantasy story uh, and film from I think it was the '80s or it was either the late '80s or early '90s. But uh, it's it's full of Jim Henson's, you know, puppetry and aesthetic and like the, this really unique setting. It's inside this labyrinth. It's and it's a dark fantasy. It's not mm -hmm. like dark, dark. Like a like it's still it was more PG family friendly, but it, as dark as you can go within that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like uh, we're talk like it kind of like. Uh... It, it kind of goes in that scary direction that kids really like, you know? Oh, yeah. Like, there, there's some, there's definitely some moments that really freak you out. Like, for me as a kid, it was the hands. Like, there's a scene where the main girl falls uh, into a trap in the labyrinth, and she falls, and a bunch of these hands that, use, that form together to make mouths with these really twisted uh, voices to talk to her, and they catch her. It's, it's really... It's... it's freaky there was a lot of light-hearted moments but there are some moments that just stick with you because they're just oddly scary yeah jim henson can get really really weird when he wants to or yeah. when he wanted to <laughs> yeah i'd say just looking at these these images and this scenery like atmospherically i'm reminded of the labyrinth or or dark crystal if you've seen that mm -hmm. like that same uh, I'm, I'm, I'm more fam i am more familiar with that Okay, it kind of reminds me of that tonally, just like looking at the images. It's dark, but it's not overly so. And there, yeah, like with like Jim Henson's like designs, it's also very quirky and almost cartoony. Yeah, well, and the neat part is like uh, if you if you just Google it, I'd say probably at least like ninety percent of those images are like things fans have made. I mean, possibly. Um, I mean, they're... there's there's, I mean, just uh, from what I remember from the road book, I just looked at it myself. I, I, let's see, out of like the first like 10, I think maybe one or two is actually an official piece of art, you know? I and mean, where would the official stuff be? Let's see, uh, there is a Patreon page he has, which you can download the rules for free and as well as um, some other content. Uh, there's a Kickstarter here, Turn it 28, the Forlorn Hope. Yeah, yeah, that's the latest. They've been doing some uh, 3D printed like model uh, STL files, so they put out a unit of infantry, and they're working on the four long hope right now. Man, it looks fascinating. I, I'd love to see uh, where that can go, but it does seem like it is fairly early on. Oh yeah, yeah. Right, like I said, right now they're working on a part of the world like actively um called the sump which is uh, from my understanding supposed to be like an industrial zone so they that's kind of where they they had like a contest for someone to design a tank to be put into to be kind of taken up as like the official i, I guess reference point for players looking through the rule book you know yeah which uh i've seen some like some of the stuff the fans create i've I, the fans of creative have just been kind of insane. Like, uh, I think my favorite example is somebody made a tank with a giant sewing needle on the back, with, which they said the point of it was to um, lace the ground with barbed wire, which is the most insane thing I've heard of. <laughs> yeah, like, it's that nutty creativity I think we need more of nowadays. Yeah, yeah. yeah just, I think just anybody a bad who, shit, um... like a bad shit kind of setting, kind of like Alice yeah, yeah. in Wonderland levels of crazy and quirky and just. It doesn't make sense, but it does, like, very loosely. That Those kinds of, like, things. I, if Turn of 28 goes the distance, I'd love to see this grow. Yeah, yeah, and it's very, like, um, a lot of the humor is from just, like, I guess insulting the people, the regiment, people in the regiment, like the, um, 
the leaders are called snobs and um and their stats the uh their armor stat is their invulnerable their, their vulnerability and th the role to hit is called their inaccuracy so there's um there's there's a lot of like uh i guess humor at the expense of the characters in the game and that seems fitting for with the setting and it, it looks it, it seems like a fun kind of campy yeah yeah I, i'm kind of uh I'm, I'm hoping to see it get more traction. I think recently, um, oh, it was the TTS guys. Um, they they did a battle report for uh, Tournament 28, so you can, if anybody's interested, they can kind of look that up. They uh, really nailed down the feeling of the setting in that battle report. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'm assuming the people behind Tournament 28 don't have a problem with it. Uh, I'll link the... Uh... Uh, do I want to link the Kickstarter I just found, or this? Uh, Term 28, Gardens of Hecate, or Hecate. I don't know if that's official. Uh, I, ble I believe that's a... Um, I want to say it's a fan thing. I'll, I'll link the Patreon. Uh, it, Max, Max Fitzgerald, right? Yeah, yeah, I believe that's it. Yeah, I'll link that since that seems to be the the okay. Yeah, I'll put that in the description for anyone who watches the VOD or who's currently watching live. Uh, yeah, because I I'd love to support this project. It it looks quirky, fun, and like I said, it, remind, it reminds me a little bit of Jim Henson's style of like a dark fantasy. Maybe a little bit of a uh, Tim Burton mixed in a little bit in there. Yeah, and and definitely what attracted me to it is um I do play I do have um orcs for forty k with some scratch built vehicles and this kind of has that same um thing in it of like there's a lot of humor but there's also a ton of creativity free to do just whatever you feel like there's um there's like people will make regiments and they'll like um eh, there'll be green stuffing all sorts of ridiculous heads like I think there's one where there's just like a worm sticking out of the dude's shoulders essentially and stuff like that yeah. the um the fans stuck kept making a bunch of uh japanese inspired miniatures so they went ahead and add them added them to us to the setting oh no way i'm sorry i, I was looking through the patreon there's a public post one of the original artists behind 40k he's there uh, I, I like a showcase for Turner 28. Oh, that's cool. I didn't notice that. <laughs> yeah. Um, either that or it's a man who inconveniently looks exactly like him, but um, it's the same artist who's behind so, the more iconic artwork behind uh, 40K. I'm trying to remember his name off the top of my head. Um, I recognize his face instantly, but I'm trying to remember his name. Crap. Chat, um, do me a favor. Remember for me. Again, I... Ah, I hate it when my brain, like, sifts out names, but I can see faces, and I'm like, I know who that is. Famous... Artist 40k... The laundry list. Uh, John Blanche. There we go. Jesus, that took too long. Yeah. Yeah. That that is definitely John Blanche. Yeah. If, if anyone wants to know what. Uh, John Blanche has done for artwork. If we go to here, he is responsible for the most iconic artworks for 40k, at least in my opinion, certainly the most iconic artworks. Uh, 
Yeah, right here. This artwork of the Emperor that I think we've all seen, this is a John Blanche. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah this... very, that very, like, a uh, washed out kind of, uh, kind of look. Yep. And, and again, in my opinion, I'd put John Blanche up there as the visualizer of 40K. His artwork... I believe they use, um... I think they use this artwork for like a deck of just like normal playing cards that they put out. I don't know if they still sell it. That's uh, the 40k ones. All right, maybe. Yeah, these artworks that he did are. The, for me, when I think of 40k art, I think of all of his work, including the Black Templar piece. I mean, that is so cool to see him uh, stop by and check out uh, the Turnip Twenty Eight. That that that's pretty cool. That yeah, I think awesome. they have already had some uh, conventions in the UK. I mean, I hope they do a convention nearby where I live. Although, no one ever holds a convention near where I live. <laughs> <laughs> Not ever. <laughs> Damn living in Maine. And the thing is, we'd be a perfect spot to do a, a grim dark kind of setting. Or, or like a showcase or something. I mean, it's Maine. We're known for nothing but Eldritch Horrors and Stephen King. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I was going to say Stephen King's aware. <laughs> that, that's our one claim to fame. Ah, <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, this kind of like became my new personal obsession after I um, lost interest in 40k. Uh, it kind of scratched that similar itch, itch of just being, I guess, a mix of like historical aesthetics, but also taking taking them in like a brand new kind of creative direction. You know? Yeah, I mean, I can see why. Um, I probably, I, I might, I'll probably invest a little bit when I have money, spare money, a little bit, <laughs> just just to support them in their uh, Patreon, just for a little bit. Again, I don't really have a lot of spare money these days, but uh, yeah, I mean, I'm <laughs> very happy to see the birth of a new uh, hobby, and with a very unique aesthetic in the sphere, that's for sure. And hey, John Blake yeah. showing up to check it out. I mean, the fact that it caught his interest alone catches mine all the more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a it's a it's very forgiving to new players because the rules are very simple. There's only like uh, three weapons you pick, you load out between your dudes, so you have a lot of freedom and what you can stick in the miniature's hands, you know. Um, and of course, you don't have to make them look any good because they're supposed to be covered in mud and soot. So. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for bringing it to my attention. Everybody else is here attention, man. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. No problem. Have a good one. Damn, that was cool. All right, guys. Uh, I think we can call it the... Oh, hold on. Spiff your mage. Once again, I only find out about it, about Nazmagon stream, because I see the VC icon on Discord and it's called Hide Server. God damn it, YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's YouTube for you. They don't send out notifications no more, and it's annoying. It's really annoying. It's like, you know, people subscribed, right? You know, the notification button doesn't need to be set to all to at least notify them about live streams. I mean, come on. But, yeah, that's YouTube. God damn them for never, ever, ever doing what they say on the tin. Like, oh, turn on notifications. Okay, they're on. All right, I'm never going to tell you about a live stream until like three days after it was over. Ah. Uh, is there anything about the Gundam stuff earlier? Oh, Asmo is even worse. The Xeon soldiers that did that were not, were not told they were pumping nerve gas. They were told it was a knockout gas and they were to be taken in. And there were to be taken away. Oh, okay. Yeah, that is worse. War in the Pocket is another one that shows the horrors of war. K 
can't be right now. Alright. Uh, well, I'm going to wrap up things there, guys. Uh, we had a... Uh, we did end up taking a huge chunk of the stream to talk about Gundam, but I, did, I do think we achieved talking about uh, alternative hobbies. Uh, talking about... we Obviously, we talked about Gunpla for an extensive amount of time and the Gundam franchise, but outside of that, even, we talked about War Machine Host, we talked about... Uh, uh, Carnivale, or Carnival, and I think at this point my brain is just trying to screw me over, uh, Gaslands, Jesus, why would that not stay in my brain, Gaslands, uh, we talked about Turnip 28 at the end there, which I think is the best one we could have brought up, because that one's fascinating to me, and I'm definitely interested in keeping my eye on it, uh, it could have been worse. I could have been talking about Battletech again. And yeah, we, you could have brought up Battletech. And I'm actually surprised no one else did. Uh, we talked about Conflict 47 before we talked about Battletech. I figured Battletech would have been the first thing people brought up. But nah, it, was, no, it wasn't brought up at all. <laughs> Which is fine by me. Before you all head out, make sure to leave a like on the stream. Share, support. I much appreciate it. Subscribe if you're new to the channel. All that fun stuff. Um, again, upcoming, the next, like, video, I'm working on a sizable video project in the form of trying out Gunpla for the first time, and on this very stream, uh, while we were talking about Gundam, the Gundam I ordered arrived, so, <laughs> that wasn't planned, I swear, like, I don't, <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't a scripted event, like, just perfectly, it was delivered. That that like that's a, that's a great stream moment right there. But uh, yeah, and after this stream is done, I'm gonna start recording that over there. So yeah, but thanks so much, guys, for tuning in. I hope you guys are all having an amazing uh, day, evening, night, whatever it may be. I'm gonna continue my Gundam journey in the backdrop, get that video done, and then probably, hopefully, my Conflict Forty Seven army will finally arrive. I can do a video on that, get through that, do that stuff. Yeah, there's plenty of projects upcoming. Uh, Vox, uh, the Vox Radio Show is kind of on hold while I'm doing these couple side chunky projects. Don't worry, though. I'm getting back to that as soon as I get through both the Gundam one and the Coffee 47 Army, which is all the more motivation to get through them efficiently. Not rush them, but do them efficiently and then get back on track. But, uh, yeah, love you guys. Make sure to leave a like. All that fun stuff. I'll catch you guys later. Bye-bye. Oh, should have done the Battletech talk, but Gundam came in and, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Happens.